Well, thank you, Carol. Uh, it's a great privilege to be in Oregon again. This is the third time I've been here. The first was in 1983. The second uh, was in about 1996, and uh, now back here in uh, 2016. Uh, during today's presentation, I'm going to challenge your thinking about the nature of the task that's ahead of us in terms of promoting the well-being of children and families. Uh, I'd like to begin just to clarify for everyone here um, what Triple P is about and where it comes from. So this is a program that evolved from my doctoral research which started in 1978 at the University of Queensland. The program is owned by the University of Queensland and um, Triple P International is the company that's been licensed by my employer to disseminate the program worldwide and in accordance with the intellectual property policy, royalties from that work are distributed back to the university through faculty, school, centre and to contributory authors. I'm the founder of the program, as Carol mentioned, the lead author and a consultant to Triple P International in relation to getting the program out there. Um, I'd like us just to think for a moment about a great place to raise healthy, competent, well-adjusted children. Uh, because we're going to be talking about context today and what it might actually look like to live in a community that values and supports and celebrates the importance of the parenting role in raising children. This would be a community that recognises and promotes the idea that the well-being of children and families is actually a shared community responsibility. It's not just individual parents doing individual things in private with their children. Uh, it's a community that would respect a parent's role in determining the values, skills and behaviours they want to promote in their children and the parenting practices that they use to get there. It would promote the social and cultural connectedness of families and support the idea of family self-regulation and autonomy in raising children. So it's not about prescribing good enough parenting, it's not about telling people how they must raise their children. However, it is about making high-quality, culturally informed, evidence-based parenting support programs accessible to all families. And in this way, ensuring that parents are empowered and skilled to participate in planning and decision-making that impacts on their children and on their families. So the context is one where our aspiration is for all parents to have the knowledge, skills and confidence they need to raise their children in a safe, loving and low conflict world. That this would be a place where positive parenting becomes socially normative, where adverse childhood experiences are minimised and where population based approaches to parenting support become a policy priority. And who would benefit from such a place? Everyone would. Children would, parents would, the community would. Now, when we think about the relationship basis of human capability, uh, Tony Biglin and our audience has argued this point probably as well as anyone I know, which is about seeing the foundations of competence laying in the development of positive, nurturing, pro-social relationships. These lay the foundations to not only secure bonding and attachment, but better self-regulatory capability in children, fewer social, emotional and behavioural difficulties, greater academic success. And that adds up to a better life course outcome for many, many children. Conversely, when children are raised in environments that are dysfunctional, uh, that contribute enormously to children's exposure to toxic stress. Kids in this world develop poorer self-regulatory capability. They have an increased risk of social, emotional and behavioural difficulties and of course greater risk for problems like antisocial behaviour and substance abuse and poorer long-term outcomes. Uh, when we think about Folletti's work to do with adverse childhood experiences and the impact of these ten ACEs on children's life course, um, it's alarming to remind ourselves that uh, by the age of 60, when a young, a young person has had four or more of these risk factors on the left, uh, there's a remarkably increased prevalence of a wide range of mental health and physical health problems. 
Uh, these are life course altering risk factors that uh, continue to have their impact on people's lives throughout their life. Now, when we talk about positive parenting, in the Triple P model, we talked about five key core principles that need to be, I believe, expanded somewhat to capture the true nature of what positive parenting has to offer in terms of well-being to children and families. The first principle, of course, you'll be familiar with, it's to raise kids in a safe and engaging, interesting environment. An environment where there are plenty of age-appropriate things for children to do are environments where children are busy, they're less likely to get up to mischief, less likely to get into trouble. When this is a world of encouragement and positivity, a positive and learning environment as opposed to an environment <coughs> full of negativity, criticism, harshness and so on, uh, children are going to do better. They're going to do better in terms of their capacity to regulate their behaviour and emotions in a consistent environment where there's assertive, consistent discipline, where there are boundaries and limits and parents have the knowledge, skills and confidence to enforce those limits in age appropriate ways. And of course this has to be a world where parents have reasonable expectations both of themselves and of their children. There are no gold medals for martyrdom in parenthood and so when you think about people aspiring to perfection that's a, uh, a parenting environment fraught with anxiety and disappointment and frustration. It is so much more difficult for us to be nurturant, caring, contingent and responsive to our children if we don't take care of ourselves. If we're miserable, if we're lonely, if we're living in conflict, we're living in high levels of stress in dangerous neighbourhoods, this is a world where parenting is much, much more difficult to undertake uh, in an appropriate fashion. However, in addition to this, with the earlier and earlier transition into the workplace of parents after having a baby, we're all confronted with the challenge of managing competing and sometimes incompatible work and family responsibilities. And so the capacity for individual parents to manage this journey well uh, is important in terms of their psychological availability to their children. Parents have an important role also in influencing peer relationships. There's some interesting new data showing that the way in which parents of children who appear victimised or bullied at school respond to the kids' complaints about bullying in the family environment influences the future likelihood of children continuing to be bullied at school. And so the idea of parents developing a set of enabling skills that are related to friendship making and kids having successful peer relationships is becoming increasingly important. When parents interact and advocate for their children, whether it's their children in childcare or an early childhood educational setting or in uh, elementary school or beyond, when parents are pushy, demanding and entitled, it is extremely stressful for teachers. One of the major contributory factors for teachers resigning from teaching is conflict with parents. A quarter of all Principals in Australian primary schools have been physically assaulted by parents. And when you think about the threat that that, that uh, represents and the skill inadequacies that that captures in terms of how parents speak up on behalf of their children, it highlights the critical importance of this home school communication. Maintaining healthy relationships with extended family members is also important because there is a considerable amount of uh, custodial care and care that is the responsibility of grandparents and other extended family members, particularly if a parent has a mental health problem, a substance abuse problem, and uh, it is not easy to be parenting toddlers when you're 65, when you're 70. Um, and there is a considerable amount of stress associated with that parenting role. The final part of positive parenting is to remind ourselves that parents are part of a community of other people who care for children. And it's not just other parents in their streets, in their neighbourhoods, in their communities, in their churches, in their religious organisations. It's um, others who are caring for kids in their role in loco parentis in uh, an educational uh, context. So our journey in promoting positive parenting in the community 
has taken a lens on this problem that has argued that this needs to be tackled as a whole of population issue. Uh, it's simply not enough to have targeted programs at the pointy end focusing on the worst kids, the most difficult families, and think we're going to do anything about reducing the prevalence rates of these problems at a population level. So what it required us to do is to start thinking about different kinds of outcomes because traditionally in parent training work it was all tracking outcomes at an individual case level or at a family level. But we need to start thinking about what are the impacts of these interventions on population level indicators of the well-being of children, on the levels of child maltreatment, founded cases of child abuse, hospitalisations, injuries uh, to children, children being re removed to out-of-home placements and so on. It required the development of a system of parenting support, not individual programs that were disconnected from each other. And this system needed to involve a blending of universal offers with targeted engagement for the most vulnerable and at risk uh, families in the community. Uh, we can describe this as kind of proportionate universalism. Everyone gets something, some folk need more than others, and some folk are going to find it much harder to engage with the system of intervention. In order to make it work, it needed to be explicitly a multidisciplinary approach. There are many different disciplines that provide counsel, support and advice to parents who have a mandate to do so, but who are undertrained, who are not well skilled in the, the, the art and science of parent consultation work. In addition to that, we needed a strategy that was comprehensive, so it's not it could not be, could never be a one-size-fits-all because parents differ in their preferences, their capacity to engage with programs and what it is that they're able to do at a given point in time. It needed to be inclusive of all families and when you think of all families you're thinking about the many, many diverse ways in which parenthood, um, people, people enter parenthood. So we need to think of parents of children who have developmental disabilities, parents themselves who have developmental disabilities, um, parents of children with chronic illnesses, um, parents who are in step families and blended families and adoptive families and foster homes, um, parents who uh, become part of the lives of children in a temporary and transitional way that still can influence the kind of outcomes that uh, happen with children. And of course we needed an approach that was culturally relevant. Um, one of the major issues that confronts this field from a public health perspective is the idea that um, the, the parenting principles and practices that might be relevant in the West, in middle class families, in, uh, in communities like this may not transfer, may not transport well to other cultures, particularly cultures in poverty. And there's some interesting new data to uh, challenge that assumption. So when we started to think about the development of a system of parenting support, this is the model that we evolved. A media and communication strategy with one fundamental principle behind it. That is, it's healthy and normal to prepare for parenthood so get involved. To eliminate stigma to be associated with parenting programs. And then to have a tiered continuum of parenting advice of programs, each of which had been evaluated uh, in terms of increasing intensity of intervention support. So uh, the brief parenting advice level, what we call primary care, triple P, is light touch intervention. Low intensity contact with family doctors, paediatricians, with uh, uh, public health nurses, with uh, uh, directors of childcare centres, with teachers. Um, so for example, we run a, uh, a large scale seminar program as a transition to school program or a transition to high school program that provide 90 minute seminars. The power of positive parenting, raising confident, competent children, raising resilient children. Light touch, low intensity, deliberately designed that way. Um, then there's more intensive program offers that have to do with topic specific discussion groups or workshops. These would include two hour sessions on bedtime problems, dealing with disobedience, dealing with sibling conflict, dealing with homework. 
And these are topic specific, they stand alone, but they're in age groupings from toddlerhood to the preschool, primary school to secondary school. Um, each of these topic specific discussion groups needed to be evaluated in its own right to determine what kind of impact it would have. Then you move to the more intensive level four intervention, which is eight to 10 sessions of either group or individual consultation. This variant is the traditional, um, more intensive active skills training. This is where Triple P started. It started as a home coaching model with disruptive preschool aged children. The interventions were all delivered in the home. But now, at this level four, we have four different ways in which parents can do this intensity of intervention. They can do it in a group, uh, 10 to 12 parents. They can do it individually with a, uh, a, a parent as a professional. They can do it as a self-directed, self-help, text-based program. They can do it as an online program, so eight modules of online intervention, or they can do it as an online program with assistance, with uh, telephone consultation or support. And then the most intensive level of intervention were the, for those families who had additional risk factors that were simply not shifted by the lighter touch uh, intervention. So here we're talking about programs like Pathways Triple P for parents of kids who've become involved in the child protection system. Uh, we're talking about Family Transitions Triple P for kids who have experienced the breakdown of their parents' relationship, separation and divorce. Lifestyle Triple P for parents of children who are overweight and obese and so on. So one of the things that this system of intervention sought to adopt was what we refer to as a self-regulatory framework. Now this self-regulatory framework is particularly important for a population-based uh, parenting strategy for one fundamental reason. Parents don't like unsolicited parenting advice. They don't like to be ha told how to raise their children. So that any model of intervention that was seen as overly prescriptive, too demanding, compulsory and so on would be associated with a coercive element that would occasion a lot of avoidance and easily develop stigma to be associated with it. When you think about self-regulatory capability and the way in which we think about it in Triple P is that we teach parents the tools of personal change, goal setting, self-evaluating, self-monitoring, how am I going relative to where I wish to be, where I wish to be as the parent, which means the goals that parents are working towards have to be constructed, sometimes co-constructed with someone who's working with that parent, but fundamentally goals the parent owns. Those goals, of course, can be informed by a person's beliefs, by their culture, by their priorities, what it is they consider to be important. The process of developing self-regulatory skills, self-management skills, is that parents become more self-efficacious. They believe in their capacity to do the job ahead of them, the tasks ahead. And when they do it and change occurs, they attribute it to their own efforts rather than luck, an act of God or the devil. In the process of becoming uh, to developing a higher level of personal agency, you have a formula being created for people becoming more self-sufficient, more independent, more autonomous and less reliant on others. Most parenting is actually done in private. And so it's extremely important that when parents are learning skills, they're learning to do the skills, to apply the skills with the minimally sufficient level of support they require to get on with it. Not how much support do you need, but how much, how little support may you require to do the job ahead of you, competently. Now that self-regulatory process is applied right throughout the Triple P system. So if you think about it, parents themselves are trying to use self-regulatory principles to teach kids to do things for themselves, how to dress themselves, how to brush their teeth, how to search the internet safely how to cross a road, how to do many of the skills of the tasks of daily living, and to do so in a way where we're using prompting and modelling and nudging kids, and we're using fading out of those prompts, and we're moving from 
getting uh, frequent encouragement and positive attention to that attention becoming less frequent, more unpredictable, more intermittent. So it's much more driven by the execution of the skill and the behaviour and the natural consequences that stem from that than being a prompt dependent learner who's reliant on parental assistance. That same principle can be applied to the training of practitioners and for purveyor organisations working with agencies who are adopting evidence-based programs. And so when you think about it, it's not about the fidelity monitoring police being external to an agency who's in this controlling relationship with the managers and the staff who've learnt the program. It's about providing those agencies with the skills, the tools and the motivation to do the right thing by their clients and to deliver the programs that are designed in particular ways with fidelity so they get the best outcomes. So when you think about the evolution of a body of knowledge, we also want to maintain the highest standards of evidence that we're able to. And when you think about evidence, it's important not just from a scientific perspective or a policy perspective, but it's important as a consumer issue. Parents want to invest their time in participating in programs that work. Uh, we've done a number of um, consumer preference surveys looking at the factors that will influence parents' willingness to participate in a parenting program. Generally, the number one feature of a program that is seen to be the most influential determinant of that decision is that the program has been demonstrated to work. So it's not just an issue relating to science or, the, or, or, or professionals. So when we start to think about moving from a parenting paradigm that historically has done a wonderful job in targeting aggressive kids, kids who are disruptive, non-compliant, conduct problem kids, kids with ADHD, we, these are kids with pre-existing pretty well-defined problems or who are seen as being at high risk for those problems. This is moving it to a different level. This is about optimising the well-being of children. It's not just about the offset of negative things. It's not just about turning off um, difficult behaviours that exist in the community. But what does it mean for children to be growing up in a world where they have parents with the knowledge and skill who can encourage their language, their creativity, their engagement and enjoyment of sport, the many vast variety of things that constitute the opportunities for young people as they're growing up. And positive parenting speaks to all of those outcomes. Most of the research focuses on turning off negativity. Most of the opportunities for application to promote prosociality and the skillfulness of kids going into the future is constructive. It's about building new repertoires of skills, uh, not destroying old ones. Um, However, a body of knowledge has to be open to criticism. Triple P has had criticism. We've needed to deal with that. We've needed to be able to see that some of this criticism is absolutely legitimate and it applies to many other parenting programs in our field as well. But once you come down to the issue of um, does it work? Does, does a program like Triple P work? Look, it's actually a very complicated question. I've taken the liberty of reworking Gordon Paul's classic quote about psychotherapy and framed the question like this. What intervention delivered by whom, in what context, via which delivery modality is effective with what kind of parent, child or youth problem, at what age and in what family, cultural or community context? And how does the intervention effect come, around, come about? It's quite straightforward, isn't it? Well, it's actually going to take many years for us to answer this question. Uh, the most recent comprehensive meta-analysis of Triple P, which was published in Clinical Psychology Review in 2014, there have now been seven separate meta-analyses of just focusing on Triple P as single interventions, and they've all pretty much found the same thing in terms of uh, positive effect sizes for child outcomes in terms of social, emotional, behavioural problems and changes in parenting practices. What I want to draw to your attention, however, is that there are 
Healthy effect sizes associated with each of the levels of intervention, ranging from things like radio programs that have done seven podcasts of positive parenting to the evaluations of three television series where parenting programs have been, uh, uh, where Triple P um, has been uh, shared as an observational documentary that parents could uh, track along with. And so the question is, uh, is there a, a single level of intervention that is appropriate for a particular type of family or a type of child or parent, but others are not suitable? Well, we used to believe that those families with the most complex problems needed the most intensive intervention. And the whole system was premised on this kind of idea that as the range of risk factors multiplied, then you would need a more intensive intervention. We're starting to review that conclusion because sometimes it's the opposite that gets the most traction and it's to do with elegant simplicity. Sometimes families are so overwhelmed with complexity in their life, they're looking for a light at the end of the tunnel that shows them that there is hope, there is a possibility that things can be turned around. Um, there have been about 5% of all um, triple P studies that have had null findings. 65% of those 5% have actually been conducted by our group and these are with programs that we haven't disseminated. There's a small number of studies that have been a uh, failure to replicate. And now about, as of about two days ago, 47% of all evaluation studies of triple P have not involved the developer. Now if you look at this plot uh, this graphical depiction of the evolution of a body of knowledge over a 30-year period. Um, what you see here is there's now nearly 700 papers that have been published on Triple P. There have been 246 evaluation studies, including 125 RCTs. So these are studies that have involved nearly 1,000 authors across 308 academic and research institutions across 28 countries. Uh, so we're talking about a body of knowledge that is not only um, rapidly evolving, but it's rapidly evolving in a diverse cross-cultural context um, with a science community that is created around it with some absolutely fantastic knowledge sharing uh, taking place. It's involved a wide variety of different types of evidence. Triple P started as a series of single case studies published in the Journal of Applied Behaviour Analysis right back in the early 80s. These were individual cases studied intensively with observational data looking at the impact of taking a self-management approach to working with parents and looking at its impact. And now we're up to, as I was saying, over 120 RCTs. There have been quasi-experimental studies, uncontrolled service-based evaluations, many meta-analyses, um, lots of consumer evaluation studies, uh, and increasingly studies in low and middle income countries. And it's moving increasingly towards the use of mixed methods in terms of the methodologies used. Um, there's something about uh, the qualitative research um, uh, data that's collected around these studies that tell something different about the journey of families, their experience of the interventions and what it means to them. Um, people often ask, look, do the effects of Triple P maintain? Well, 70 studies have looked at this with follow-up periods from two months to 36 months and then last year there were two long-term follow-up studies. Kurt Halweg's work in Germany evaluating group triple P when delivered to parents of three to four year olds doing a 10 hour investment in learning positive parenting skills. 10 years later there are significant differences in the levels of behavioural and emotional problems um, in the children, uh, sorry, in the adolescents in terms of internalising, externalising and parent dysfunctional parenting practices. And then Smith last year did a 15 year follow up of group triple P um, using linked administrative data with none of the original researchers involved in it and found uh, once these kids started school there were significantly higher levels of literacy, numeracy and school attendance right up to grade 11 and significantly lower levels of involvement with emergency room visits due to child maltreatment. 
So 25 countries um, are, are sort of seriously involved and, and a country is defined as being involved if they've actually commissioned formal training. It's not enough to have a practitioner in that country who say come to the US to train in Triple P or Australia. It's where there's a serious contracted commitment to it. There have been 6,488 courses, nearly 97,000, uh, we're getting close to 100,000 training places and 68,872 unique practitioners. So this is a work that's now reaching of millions of children and families around the world. But there is so much more to do. Um, we live in a world of um, uh, uneven distribution of income. Australia is no different in that regard and we have a major problem with intergenerational tra transmission of poverty. Families living um, in the, below the poverty line, uh, children growing up in families who have never known work in the par their own families, the grandparents of those kids, uh, no one has participated in work. So we're involved in a major new population study looking at the effects of the implementation of the Triple P system, the full multi-level system offered universally to all families from birth to age 16 free of charge funded by the state. Okay, and we're looking at the effects of this in the 36 lowest socioeconomic areas, the most disadvantaged suburbs in our cities and we're using a design that involves propensity score matching with other parts of the country for which there is no implementation of the Triple P system. And so this is the Every Family Triple P system population study. The whole idea is it's the best practice implementation of Triple P. Um, we're seeking to reach a minimum of 25% of eligible parents in the targeted age range of parents that we're studying of two-year-olds to eight-year-olds. And the aim fundamentally is to improve the outcomes for these disadvantaged communities and reaches the vehicle that is going to enable us to do so. Now, when you think about the broader ecological context for parenting and you think about the variables that as program developers, as uh, as practitioners, as agencies serving communities that we can do something about. These are captured by these, um, this inner circle here. When we think about the broader social ecology, the Bron from Brenner kind of view of the, 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 the context for child development, we've got to remind ourselves that there are very different places around the world that children live. There's a huge difference in growing up in sub-Saharan Africa where someone is prepared to put an automatic weapon in the hands of an 11 year old to turn them into a child soldier versus growing up in Sweden or Finland who are supportive of the um, international rights of children. It's a different world in terms of child advocacy, child support and what can be done. However, the, th the things that we can do in designing our programs to, uh, and just to illustrate this very briefly, the type of messaging that we use, who it targets, the gender, the ethnicity, um, the way in which the uh, message is, is shared, whether it's uh, a public broadcast message, whether it's free, whether it's delivered in a context that is part of some other normative activity that the parent may be involved in, and whether the advice that is provided or the information provided is seen as being culturally acceptable, the example is appropriate and so on. All of these are manipulable aspects of the message. Now I'm not going to go through each of these variables that we can manipulate through program design other than to say that these are the drivers of what we might be able to shift in a population-based rollout of an intervention. So in this um, study we are looking at the process of the implementation of the Triple P system and we're hypothesising based on prior research that this system at a population level is going to make changes in terms of harsh coercive parenting, self-efficacy, positive parenting, parental teamwork, family conflict and overall parental well-being and, and mental health. But it is also going to activate community processes that create 
a better social context for children. And this includes collective efficacy, our belief that our community can sort and manage the problems that we have with our youth. And so when we have a process that is geared to the creation of collective efficacy, it's about building social capital in the community. Now, I'm just going to show you a glimpse of what this is starting to look like. So our state government has said, right, we're going to give you 6.6 .6 million to roll this out over our state. We've got about 4.6 million families in our state. The first two years, you just need to get to 140,000 families. Okay, so pretty straightforward. Um, and so the design of the intervention system is geared to provide parents of kids from birth right through to the teenage years with access to multiple levels of the system right throughout every country town, every area of the state, regardless of how remote you are. Can we turn the volume up? University of Queensland Professor Matt Sanders is in the studio this morning. Good to see you again. Good morning, Spencer. 30 years after developing Triple P, the positive parenting program at the University of Queensland, Professor Matt Sanders and the Queensland Government are bringing it home. It's a very exciting day and I think the Government should be congratulated to make this kind of commitment to promote the well-being of kids and children by supporting parenting. This is an injection of $6.6 .6 million to help families when they need that help. All Queensland parents with children from birth to age 16 are eligible for Triple P face-to-face -face sessions, Triple P online, or a variety of options across all regional areas. A light touch introduction to the positive parenting strategies is a Triple P seminar. First one is uh, 10 o'clock this morning at the Broncos Club Redfield, then 7 pm tonight, 10 am tomorrow at Wood Regional South School, 7 pm tomorrow. Well, parents must have heard that and told their friends about it. We had nearly 100 parents at that first seminar. We had the Minister for Community, Shannon Fentiman, there. She's a strong backer of the program, and the media turned up in force. This isn't about telling parents what to do, but it's about letting them know that it's okay to ask for help. We want to make sure they've got the help they need to raise the next generation of confident, capable Queenslanders. Getting media coverage is vital because some parents perceive a stigma around parenting programs, that there's something shameful about attending a course and they resist becoming involved. This whole business about building a, um, a momentum around participating in the parenting program, what that will eventually lead to is some of the families who would have otherwise not even considered doing a parenting program coming forward once it's normalised. Now whatever you did to get here, I can assure you it was worth it because today will be very special. What's happening here today is not only a Queensland first, it is an Australian yeah. first. An advantage of Triple P is that parents can choose the level of help they need, from one-off sessions like this to more intensive multi-week programs delivered in smaller groups or even one-on-one -on -one with a practitioner. One of the things that families, parents find the most challenging of all is dealing with behaviour. This is the tough part of raising children. Since the launch, staff from Triple P and many organisations have been busy getting the word out directly to families. A dedicated website is up and running for parents to select the level of Triple P to suit their needs, then register for a session best suited to them. And it's working. So far, more than 9,000 parents have accessed Triple P. And at school today, we have the Stay Positive Triple P Parenting. That's a seminar. We're going for about 90 minutes. Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'm just thrilled to be here to support the kickoff of this initiative in, in Logan. We're reaching a really good cross-section of Queensland families, probably families that we didn't think we'd even manage to get. So we're getting families who are saying they're single parents, they're identifying as Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander. <laughs> We're really confronting parenting in long times. And we're getting many more parents reporting that they speak a language other than English than what we would have expected. And we're getting some really great feedback from these parents. For me, the best thing was there's a few different strategies that I can use at home with my toddler to ensure that I avoid going down the shouting track at him when he gets frustrating. 
I'm going to definitely lower my voice <laughs> and uh, stay positive. Schools are very, very supportive. Awesome. MP Leanne Lennart, who represents the seat of Nudgee, was surprised how quickly she could fill the large hall at Virginia State School. I send invitation home with every student. Uh, in my schools across my lecture, I have 13 schools. And then I sent um, an invitation to half of my lecture, so I letterboxed half of the electorate, because it was so popular, we reached capacity of 250. Oops. Okay, oh, sorry, I'll just, uh, it's not quite finished, but it, um, I've pushed the wrong button. <laughs> and it's too hard to find where I've got to get to. But you get a sense of what's happening here, and when you've got political engagement, uh, every location there was a media call where you had the local MP, a representative from the Australian Medical Association, and you also had the um, local newspaper, radio uh, and television all doing a spot relating to the upcoming seminars and the activities and not a single bit of negativity about the whole thing. No complaints, no negative traffic coming through on websites. So it's kind of like building this um, approach where you're taking the community with you. And one of the strategies that we've used to do this is to involve consumers and end users throughout. So if you think about a theory building process where you're developing an intervention and you're incorporating at every stage of program development um, the idea of including uh, feedback from parents and end users, what you have is an intervention that's seen to be responsive to community need. It's not an imposition on a community that these outsiders are coming in and just landing this program on you. It's in fact, we did a statewide survey about the hot topics, the hot issues of parents in this state, in this month, uh, in 2015, to gauge the starting point of where things needed to be. Because if the survey was done 10 years ago or 15 years ago, there's a lot of change that's taken place in a generation. And so when we start looking at what these preferences are and you start dividing a sample of nearly over a thousand parents uh, into parents of typically developing children versus parents with a disability, uh, what you notice is that the parents of the kids with a disability are all gravitating towards the more intensive individual programs. But for parents of typically developing children, there's quite a wide range of different delivery modalities that are acceptable to them. A lot of parents are looking for online uh, access to uh, parenting programs. Um, so when you think about what you hear from what parents are saying to you, we need to keep in mind that parents' preferences are of course contextually influenced and they're not uh, invariant in terms of time and place. So one of the things that we found, for example, in the work that we did with Carol here about um, parents of children with behaviour difficulties in the US where there was a preference for online interventions, you ask the same set of questions to parents living in Panama or living in Kenya where there's a lousy internet access, then preferences are quite different from uh, what they might be in a wealthier country. So having taken that into account and remembering this caveat, just because it's free, just because it's delivered in a preferred medium and just because it's high quality doesn't mean parents are going to flock to it. Because parents everywhere have competing demands on their time, they're targeted with advertising by lots of different uh, things that the people are, are pushing them to go in particular directions. So for example, with our statewide rollout of Stepping Stones, which is the version of Triple P for kids parents of children with a disability, we did a, a, a survey, a statewide survey, that identified about 70% of the parents surveyed reported having significant difficulties with their children. And of those parents who reported having significant difficulties, about 70% of those said that if stepping stones were available in their community, they would do it. Do you know how many rocked up to do it? 10%. So even though in the presence of high need and offer, um, the family lives of parents of kids with disabilities 
can be complex. Many things can get in the road of session attendance. We didn't, of course, have an online offer for those families. But an online offer is what many families are looking for, and so this is what uh, our eight module level four triple P intervention online. People get me uh, as their personal coach who's taking them through it. Um, the question that we asked in this particular study, which has just been completed, is that um, if Triple P Online works as an intervention, as a standalone, without any support from uh, any kind of service provider, would adding phone support enhance outcomes? And the answer is yes. So basically we use trained tele telephone counsellors from a telephone counselling agency who were taught a particular way of doing the telephone consultations to activate um, self-regulatory processes, so it was always what's your agenda, what are the issues you wish to discuss today, and then use the skills of prompting the parent back to where in the online program they could find the answers to the questions that they had raised about the deployment of the interventions. And basically what we found is in a three group design where we had as the control condition internet use as usual so parents could access any parenting site they wished as the control condition. Um, in the enhanced uh, Triple P online uh, program here there were the lowest levels of behavioural difficulties reported at follow up compared to doing it on your own versus the control and this is using the Iberg uh, behaviour inventory as the primary outcome variable. And to look at what this meant in terms of how to understand these differences, this is what we found. This is the proportion of parents who are completing sessions as a function of the number of sessions. If they had phone support, 70% completed. If they hadn't, it was about 40%. And so the difference in outcome may be that the phone support actually just encourages people to do it, uh, to, to, to complete it. So this is not surprising, um, but I think what it draws to our attention is that when parents are being engaged in an intervention process and they're thinking, um, this will be brief, convenient, I can do it whenever I, I like, they forget one thing, it re requires a commitment. And that commitment is over a lifetime to their children. It's not this kind of quick fix that you're just going to do an online program, but in fact it doesn't require you to make any uh, changes. So when we start to think about implementation and we start to think about what is needed in a population-based strategy to produce change, these are some of the things that our research team has focused on and some of the key takeouts, I think, of what we've learnt through this implementation process. First of all, strong local partnerships and internal champions and agencies are really needed. It just simply doesn't happen if you, unless you've got on the ground advocacy and support for it. Uh, so uh, programs that are introduced need adequate line management support and enough security of funding to know that if they start a process there's going to be funding to do it at least the next year and hopefully the year after that. But there are a lot of places that live in such an insecure funding environment they never know where their funding is coming from and it a, a, a great deal of courage and persistence is required to uh, maintain these programs in, in many agencies. Of course, staff need to be well trained, they need to be adequately supervised, but one of the things that has become increasingly apparent to us is it's the post-training technical and consultative support at an agency level that seems to be particularly important for programs to get traction. Because if you think about leadership in agencies and line management support of a trained workforce, then it can't be just handled at an individual practitioner level. Many agencies who undertake training um, will not achieve the number of participating families served without their agency really driving this process of uh, achieving uh, uh, adequate population reach that they're aiming to do. Um, and of course, building in routine evaluation is just part of doing it properly. So evaluation should never be just a separate layer associated with research and evaluation. Every agency that's deploying an evidence-based program needs to prove that it works with their families in their context. Uh, 
And so when we start to think about the evolution of this as a body of knowledge, the reason we've only just begun is that we have a world population of 7.3 billion. Uh, there are 1.9 billion children between birth and age 14. 278 kids are born a minute around the world. And the world population um, from less developed countries comprises about 6 billion of that 7.3 billion. Um, only 12% of countries uh, have contributed to the evidence base relating to Triple P around the world. And most research has been conducted in in the US, in the UK, Australia is a, another major country, but it's a tiny, tiny fraction of the world's population of families, and the vast majority of children have no access to these programs. And we know that this is a serious, serious problem. The World Health Organization, the United Nations, have all called for evidence-based parenting programs to be implemented in low and middle income countries. Two meta-analyses have been conducted to date. Annalena Major is one and Francis Gardner was involved in another that have documented pretty well that uh, there's a huge need for these programs to be available in low resource environments. And one very interesting just published recent study is a study, a meta-analysis, looking at whether evidence-based programs in one culture will transport successfully to another. And interestingly, what was found was no difference in effect sizes from the country of development versus the country of adoption, which means there is hope. So our Triple P activity at the moment has been focusing on these low and middle income countries. And I just want to illustrate in wrapping up uh, some examples of work First of all, it's been done in Panama. Now, if you think about the outer um, areas around Panama City, it's a pretty impoverished environment. Um, there was a great deal of concern about whether Triple P would be considered culturally relevant, culturally appropriate. So the starting point was studies looking at the cultural acceptability of the parenting advice, the mode of delivery, and uh, this work has been published in Prevention Science, basically showing that the principles and the strategies, the core principles and strategies, were seen as being highly relevant. Um, the great temptation is to avoid, because of the huge need, the need to do any proper randomised trialling, and this is a mistake. This is the context that this RCT was conducted in. Families living in poverty, struggling to get money to cover their basic needs for food and clothing, living in tiny homes, high urban crime rates, parents not finishing high school, worried about kids getting involved in, um, in gang activity or quitting school. And so this was the RCT that's now published in Prevention Science, and the intervention that was chosen was a two-hour, brief, light-touch um, discussion group on dealing with disobedience. And the reason that that was chosen is that parents surveyed said they wanted brief parenting interventions as their preference for how, not a multi-session program. So this is what was trialled. The uh, average effect size for this two-hour intervention on, now if you, for those of you who know the ECB, these are pretty high base rate scores in terms of clinically elevated behaviour difficulties, tracked to nine months of follow-up showing highly significant differences relative to the controls, and smaller effect sizes on dysfunctional parenting and parental distress, but nevertheless showing the benefit and the cultural acceptability of the intervention. Now I want to turn to Africa. We've just returned from a, um, our first study in the slums of Nairobi, looking at parenting in the context of extreme poverty. <coughs> poverty. Um, I just want to share with you a little bit about this journey because it was quite emotional. It was extremely um, uh, uh, interesting, e extremely interesting experience. And remember, in the world of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, when you're living in extreme poverty and you haven't got clean water and you haven't got jobs and you haven't got a reliable food supply, the thought is that parenting is way down there on the list of what's important. I think this is completely wrong. These parents are parenting their kids every day and they're very concerned about their kids' well-being and what it is they can do in an environment 
of poverty to produce upwardly aspirational kids who can get out of poverty. Um, it was expressed to me by one parent who said, who said, look, I want my kids to get off the rubbish dump and s stop searching for food and go to school. And I said, and what else is important to you about parenting? She said, they fight all the time and they don't do as they're told. <laughs> you know, I was thinking, well, that sounds vaguely familiar. program would give an opportunity for parents here in Nairobi to develop new parenting skills. When I've been out here in the past with the Evan Rice Foundation, one of the things that really upset me was the way that parents use corporal punishment on their children and even sometimes the husbands on the wives. So this gave an opportunity to really come and see if we can change something with a program that will develop their skills in parenting so that they have an alternative method of disciplining or bringing their children up. I blamed the TPP program because I have learned uh, several things that I will use in parenting and it's at a very crucial time because it has taught things that are within the age of my children and I can't regret giving my time to come in for this program. I'm happy with them. We, we are going to try and change the way we discipline our children. Okay, maybe we can talk, talk to them, listen to them instead of beating them. Yeah. Discipline was given through caning. And through caning. It's very common in Africa. Parents do smack their children. And, and this is not very good because we have had cases where some parents are even killing their children in the name of disciplining them because when you punish your, or when you correct your child in anger and that is one of the best things that this program is offering you know, training parents to remain calm even when you are giving instruction to your child because the moment you want to correct your child and you are angry it is highly, highly likely that you can hit this child, maybe accidentally, and the child dies or, you know, becomes injured or hurt. Yeah. It's going to change how people think on how to bring up children, because most parents here believe in corporal punishment. They believe I have to kill my child so that he or she can be a better person in life. They don't opt for, like, maybe sitting down with a child, talking to them, giving them a solution that the last lifetime. People to change their mindset on that. It was the best. It was the best thing that ever happened to me as a parent, surely. Because for those 10 years, I've never learned something like that. I've never heard anything about parenthood, about how I should pay attention to my child, how I should deal with a child if she goes wrong. I, I never knew such things, but right now I know so much about parenthood. Yeah, so GOP, it's, it's so good anyway. You know, it's, it's interesting when you think about... Um, <clears throat> sorry, I'll just... Uh, when you think about the differing context within which um, programs need to be trialled and tested out, just finally, I want to mention that the new work that we're involved in with Triple P is taking uh, a, a different approach. And what it is, is that we're looking for the synergistic interaction of currently disconnected bodies of knowledge to apply parenting to major environmental problems. So for example, we're involved in a project in Indonesia and the Philippines relating to the destruction of coastal reef uh, coastal reefs through bomb fishing and cyanide fishing. And basically the local fishermen are killing off the, uh, the fish stock on the reef, destroying the reef, and um, the, what we're working with is marine biologists and environmental scientists to combine a 
public health approach to the promotion of parenting, prosociality, and the activation of a protective response towards children in the fishing villages, and concurrently with legislative change and better policing, and concurrently measuring the health of the reef in terms of fish stock and coral, and the health of the family environment. Um, the second project is in India, focusing upon uh, children's exposure to toxins, particularly toxic fumes that stem from cooking methods in closed um, uh, villages and houses where kids are breathing in toxins that come from burning animal dung and biomass and wood for cooking methods and millions of children are dying still of this. And the work is going to focus upon the combination of clean energy the introduction of villages to the electricity grid, um, the introduction of clean water and better sanitation combined with positive parenting. And sort of the whole idea is focusing on the most extremely deprived and disadvantaged areas to activate within the community a solution that speaks to multiple risk factors concurrently, but that involve the blending of positive parenting knowledge and skills with the uh, tremendous knowledge and capability that uh, other colleagues in, in other disciplines are able to bring. So in ending, this is how I'd like to finish, is that we've learnt a lot about how to build the capacity of parents to raise well-adjusted children. What we need to be doing is the activation of community-wide processes that support positive parenting. Now, if we think about this in terms of the promotion of prosociality, by thinking about the varying contexts that we are in a position to influence, there's no better way of doing this than to take a population-based approach to parenting support and to make it a public priority. And that means adequate funding for these kind of uh, uh, programs. Uh, population level change in parenting, I believe, truly is an achievable goal and that we should not um, be satisfied until all families in our community have the opportunity to participate in a high quality, evidence-based, culturally informed intervention that promotes children's uh, well-being. So thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat> That was remarkable, just this breadth of work that you're doing. We have about 20 minutes, 22 minutes for questions and answers and discussion. We have a handheld mic that we can pass around the room so that those uh, uh, folks joining us on screen can hear your questions. So please just raise your hand and we'll get a mic to you and uh, we can have some discussion time. Hi. Hi. Yeah, go ahead, Hi. G'day. Hi. How are you? <laughs> um, you, um, every time we, I talk to you, you've sort of uh, taken on another part of the world. Um, <laughs> and I'm always uh, so impressed though, with the progress you made. Now the environment, you're going underwater uh, in your new adventure. But, I, but my question has to do with um, how do you get around political uh, you know, uh, uh, barriers? For example, I know that the um, Labour Party was elected last year in Queensland. Yep. Did that have an impact on, on getting this study done? Uh, good question. So, um, look, we always operate in a political environment and we can never as prevention scientists be afford to be bipartisan. And so what actually happened in our own state is that the Conservative opposition we had sold this idea to them before they lost power. The real challenge was to make sure the policy advisers in the departments that were going to deliver it could pass the messaging on to the new government and persuade the new government to embrace it and to continue forward with it. Fortunately, the Labor Party historically has always been seen as being um, the primary supporters of Triple P way back in the mid-90s. So it was actually a little easier than you might think to uh, win them over. 
But it's interesting that even uh, politically conservative parties, there is something about the narrative with Triple P to do with self-regulation, promoting independence, autonomy, reducing reliance on others that's attractive to them. Because what they see is the sort of the welfare state kind of sucking up all the resources and having these uh, a huge number of families becoming dependent and reliant on others. And our messaging is absolutely the opposite. Uh, so, and that seems to be um, uh, acceptable politically to both more liberally oriented uh, folk and more conservative uh, politicians. And I mean, how else do you explain that in the uh, welcoming of the seminars, uh, the opening of the seminars, as I went right throughout the state, the, the local politicians were there in force to show that they supported it. I mean, they were doing personal letterbox drops to their own constituents to get involved. This is important. We want this to happen. You know, and it's, uh, it, it just shows what is possible but you know the tenacity of pursuit and persistence and making sure that the rhetoric around families and support of families matches decisions relating to funding and security of funding and otherwise it just becomes this phony lip service and I think they need to be held to account um, uh, by you know making sure that the hard questions are asked about what they're doing to make a difference. Any other Questions or? Thank you. How does Triple P speak to birth control? Um, in terms of having a position about whether birth control is a good idea or not a good idea? Well, I see you confronting these by, by your numbers 1.9 billion children. Yep. Wouldn't it be a good idea to have fewer children? Mm -hmm. Does Triple P, as part of its program, have anything to influence the decision making of parents with respect to that? Look, the only context wherein that kind of issue would be um, focused on is the fifth principle of positive parenting, which is to do with taking care of yourself as a parent. And, you know, there are important decisions parents are making to do with whether they wish to have more children, the kind of family size that they wish to have. And we would always see that as an individual's decision and judgment that a program should not be pres prescribing about. However, by providing greater clarity around the nature of the parenting task, the responsibilities that are involved, many parents will take moment for pause to think about their own capacity to have a third or a fourth or a fifth child. Um, and so what um, I think we should be relying on is many parents being able to make sensible judgments about their own capacity to do the kind of parenting that they need to do if their goal is to optimise children's well-being. And I think the thing is that we need to activate this protective response that has to do with the promotion of prosociality in children so that parents are really attuned into the critical importance of having a family context that enables them to do that. If they're overwhelmed, they've got no resources and they've got yet more pregnancies on the way, then that's a tough call for them to be able to do both of those things, but not impossible. So you would never entertain, I would not be advocating at all that Triple P practitioners be going around with a birth control method um, in mind uh, uh, at all. In fact, we show in one of the seminars a little clip about the penguins, you know, it's, uh, um, screaming at this mother penguin and she ends up kicking them into the ice. And uh, the bottom line is that 73% of parents are all stressed and it's a condom ad. You know, it's sort of saying, if you want a stress-free life, don't become a parent. But it's a joke, you know. It's kind of like a... Tom. Fantastic presentation. I agree with Hi. Every time I see you, it's a, not a new country, it's a new continent. <laughs> so, um, a couple of questions I wanted to ask you, but I guess the low-lying fruit for me today was the issue of fathers. Mm -hmm. uh, outcomes I had specific to dads and, and we have some but I also notice uh, there's a growing trend it seems like when you offer 
parenting resources and have a menu-driven kind of approach, that a lot of the dads will just uh, elect themselves out. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we'd have situations where we're having videotaping a session at home, and you see dad kind of walking by, just kind of checking out, mm -hmm. and he'd, you know, go out in the back and work on things. Of course, we try to engage him, and I know you do too. Yeah. But I, the more that we have this kind of uh, approach, are you finding that fathers are less involved in, in the aspect of Triple B? Would you like to? Are you trying to move on that? Yeah, look, we've just published an RCT in behaviour research and therapy looking at father effects of Triple P where you have active recruitment and engagement of families as a couple. And so it's specifically, the whole outreach is geared to getting both mum and dad there. And when you get that, you get great outcomes for both mums and dads and hardly any differential between the two. Um, uh, even in our most recent meta-analysis where we were looking, looking at the effects of the, all of the trials that had father data, even though fathers may not have participated in the intervention, there are smaller but significant effect sizes for fathers. So mothers can do the program and fathers benefit and there tends to be less couple conflict with one parent doing the program. So you would never withhold for, from a parent the uh, capacity to do the program because their partner was not involved. What's interesting is what mothers do to influence fathers and uh, the, what, the kind of strategies that you use for sharing knowledge, for sharing wisdom and um, the, the one thing that I would just say is that if we reversed roles and we went out and we actively sought the engagement of fathers without engaging mothers it would be a disaster. Women don't like being told how to raise their kids, particularly by their husbands or by their partners. And if this knowledge comes from, um, you know, kind of a men carrying the message to women, I don't think it works anywhere near as well as the other way around, unless it's done with a mandate from that, uh, uh, the first parent. Whether the landscape will change with online access to programs like Triple P, um, I think we're too early to tell. Um, lots of the codes that are picked up by families, mothers do them, you know, and, uh, but it doesn't mean that fathers don't benefit from them uh, and don't want to be involved. But I think the one area that, um, where we have made significant progress with fathers is workplace delivery of Triple P. Um, we've got a great sort of slide of uh, um, Triple P deliver being delivered to petrochemical company workers in Turkey and there's a whole kind of um, room full of dads who are uh, doing Triple P as part of their workplace lunchtime intervention um, in the workplace. Convenient, um, hard to escape from. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, I think we just have to be clever. The other thing that we're looking at is engagement of fathers through sports organisations. We've got a trial program called Active Triple P that targets children's transition into a sport or an organised sport and the whole idea of you know dads are much more likely to be involved in the kids uh, involvement in sports and games so you know and they are embarrassed when their kids are misbehaving at training and performing on the the field but it's also a way of getting to better spectator behaviour so that's around the corner <coughs> Yep. Well, we had two forays with it. We were invited by a group called Parenting Across Africa um, to, um, to come to Nairobi to do uh, sort of presentations to agencies and organisations that were working with families. That triggered an interest locally in um, at least trialling the program. There was a great deal of uncertainty about whether it would work, whether it would be culturally appropriate. And what we tried to convey to the locals there is that this is not about prescribing anything. It's not about forcing this program onto you. This is only going to happen if you want it to happen and it's considered to be culturally relevant and appropriate. So we did the cultural relevance study first 
that established a high degree of endorsement by parents in the actual parenting skills that were being taught. Um, and then the first foray was to do an evaluation of group triple P. Um, and we trained up a group of local providers. We sent a practitioner over there to run the groups with, a, with interpreters if they were needed, if people didn't have a good command of English. And then the second one that you saw was for the evaluation of light touch um, discussion groups. Um, so um, it's, it's, it's interesting, you know, the issues that pe parents raise in very diverse contexts are very similar. You know, you can think about a child in a public place throwing a massive temper tantrum, screaming and yelling and performing. You put that child in downtown Tehran, Tokyo, Sydney, or right here in Eugene, and it looks very similar. You know, most adults universally experience it as aversive, and they want to get out of the spotlight. It's highly reinforcing to turn off the behaviour quickly, mm -hmm. so they either escalate or cave in to the demand. And there's only a few options anyway that actually work in teaching kids to become good shoppers. And so if you think about it from the perspective of um, options that parents might have, I mean, once you start talking about the practical things like getting kids to bed and encouraging them to respond to directions and so on, it doesn't matter what language you're in. Parents are experiencing it as a common, the shared journey of parenthood. It doesn't mean there aren't important cultural differences, but those things that connect us as human beings, as parents, are many more than those things that separate us. And so, you know, I remember when Triple P first came to the US, people said, African American parents are going to hate this, they're going to hate the Aussie videos and accents and this kind of thing. And it was the absolute opposite. The opposite. They liked it. And they thought it was like watching a TV show with a strange English accent. But it, it was kind of like, um, you know, where do you get a representation of language uh, in the US that will travel everywhere around the country? I mean, you've got lots of regional differences, and so do most places. You go to the north of England, you can hardly understand what people are saying in Scotland and so on. So if you used a Scottish video with people in London, you know, let alone people in Canada or, you know, Australia, you just couldn't understand it. So, um, you know, there are lots of ways of making it accessible through appropriate translation, voice synchronised dubbing. Um, we've now done trials in mainland China um, that have been published recently in behaviour modification that have shown that, um, you know, the same strategies, same principles are seen as being highly relevant and acceptable. And I mean, you think about, um, you know, we've been in this game for 30 years um, when all this early work in Oregon began with the OSLC and Jerry and so on. Um, you know, who knew that it could reach a point where the knowledge has been so widely um, dispersed that millions and millions of families around the world have been able to benefit from these kind of parenting interventions. So it's... Um, you know, it's pretty neat to have been part of that journey, to be honest. Um. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit more about how you got the politicians involved or behind? Who educated them? Did you approach them? Did they approach you? Okay, here are the tricks of the trade, really. It's to do with policy analysis and linking your pitch to their public statements. And so when you think about what uh, politicians say about what they stand for, what they believe in, what outcomes they're seeking to achieve, um, we hired, that is Triple P uh, International hired um, an expert in policy uh, analysis and policy pitches to put proposals in policy terms. And these were around announceables, basically. It's what um, the politician would be able to say on broadcast television or to their parliamentary colleagues that would be seen to connect this proposal with what they'd already said was a public priority, public policy priority. And so we went, analysed all the documents and then we set up a set of um, meetings basically to meet with policy advisers and then the ministers themselves to um, 
talk the issues through, and then we came back with costings and so on. Um, look, you're talking about, look, we, we've got a rollout going across our state, there's over four and a half million, it's only costing 6.6 .6 million. It's peanuts, it's peanuts. And um, so the assumption that to adopt a public health approach is so much more expensive and can't be afforded, it's just factually incorrect. It's the most cost efficient way of getting to very large numbers of people and having this tiered continuum that means that those who need it more get more of, more of the intervention um, clinically makes sense, it logically makes sense to people and it's the idea of minimising wastage, where people who could benefit from light touch interventions end up in 12 to 20 session programs that they don't need. So part of the uh, policy angle is also involved using, using economic data to, there's been some modelling of the South Carolina population trial in terms of cost offsets. Um, Steve Aris's group in um, the Washington State uh, Institute of Public Policy have done various independent and economic analyses of a whole range of prevention programs. Sometimes these sort of data can be cited. Um, yeah, so the mixture of um, uh, making policy sense given their stated preferences um, and the pitch relating to proposals, they're generally unsolicited. So that um, you know, if you're waiting around to get the, the question, the ask, come and brief us, you know, you, well, just don't hold your breath for that one. But the other thing is um, science communication strategies that has to do with tooling up our research enterprises so that we're constantly engaging with members of the public. Um, so all of our team have become better at Twittering and use of social media. Um, for example, um, once we started the rollout, you'd be surprised how many politicians Twitter. And so once they become a follower of your Twitter feed, it's a direct line into their thinking processes because what they then start to do is to say, this is a good idea, and they start to tweet their other parliamentary colleagues who like it and send it on. So there's a social contagion that can be built around the sharing of good ideas. Um, yeah, and then the other thing that we do is try to always have a policy person come to conferences so that um, you know, they're given an opportunity to crow and to talk about um, you know, what they're doing in this space and through their presence to in, in, uh, excite further interest, really. Matt? Yes. Uh, hi, again. I re uh, <coughs> I'm thinking back to uh, some of the early days when you had um, five, 10, 15, 20 minute loops for different uh, types of presentations, uh, depending on who you were talking to and how much time the politicians or other people yes. had. Yep. Yeah, well some people <laughs> have nanoseconds to apply to things and you've got the elevator pitches that you know, go for you know, 15 seconds, 30 seconds. Um, but at the same time, the thing that I would just draw everyone's attention to is how poorly trained most of us are in this, in this area of science communications. Um, we're not trained to be able to, to pitch an idea without you know, um, you know, peer, appearing to be a car salesman and that um, you know, to, to have the blending of science with uh, powerful argument with, we use a lot of testimonial advocacy from parents themselves, what parents are saying about their experience and those can be used very powerfully in brief presentations, uh, befores and afters. Um, you start talking about effect sizes and uh, you know, just simple tables that are 20 columns this way and 15 rows that way and say it's the data's all clear. Um, well, it's not clear to most people, um, including scientists. So it's, it's not surprising they need interpretation. So, I mean, I, th I think part of the skill is being able to think of it from their perspective, and that is that what they need to do is to tell the story to someone else. So they've got to be able to share what we're sharing with them in a way that makes sense to a third party. Let me give you one example. Years ago, I did a policy briefing with Tony Blair, the British Prime Minister at number 10. Um, there was a whole bunch of researchers and parents who had done the parenting programs, and 
um, the, the, the developers were asked to sort of talk about their, their program and uh, uh, I remember sitting next to this um, uh, Afro-Caribbean parent who had uh, two teenage boys. She was a single parent. Right at the time, it was the, a great deal of concern about knife crime in London. And that, um, so from a politician's perspective, this mother would have been seen to have kids who are high risk for that because she was talking about their behaviour problems. And anyway, Tony Blair, he, he, um, he turned to her and he said, um, tell me, what was Triple P like for you? doing it. And she turned to me and she grabbed hold of my hand and she said, thank you Triple P, you taught me not to shout. That was the single most influential thing that was said all day. Tony Blair was on Radio 5 Live being interviewed afterwards um, by, and I don't know if any of you have had experiences with the British press, but boy they can be penetrative and quite critical and and so, you know, he's being interviewed about their rollout of evidence-based programs, including Triple P in the UK, and he was asked this question. So why is the government wasting money on this nanny state stuff, um, telling parents what to do? And he said, well, I tell you, I've been speaking to lots of parents out there, and do you know what they tell me? When they do programs like this, it teaches them not to shout. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we, when you think about what resonates with an audience, politicians are masters at this. They know how to pick the gems out of what we're sharing, but it's not the tables, it's not the percentages, it's not the effect sizes, it's not even the economics a lot of time. Quite often it's the emotional journey. And it's amazing to me how um, emotionally engaged politicians can become particularly if they're parents themselves or that they've, you know, known tragedy in their family to do with kind of, you know, family breakup or mental health problems. So the, the long answer to your brief question was really the, um, the engagement of, of politicians requires messaging in different ways to, but keeping in mind who their audience is, what committees they're on, who do they have to influence, um, and... Uh, give them a good storyline that is not deception you know I mean we can you can have marketing spin that's just rubbish and it's uh, it, it's unethical it's it's parading a parent out who's you know it's like these weight loss programs that you think you know well how long did that last for kind of thing um, but if it's done w genuinely and it's done in a professional and ethical way there's no greater advocate for parenting programs than parents themselves and we have to become much better at capturing their voice. Okay, well, we're almost yeah, out of time. Yeah, One more? So kind of to piggyback on that question is, um, I think now just do I service? Yep. And um, I'm a program parent, and so I used to you know, say, oh, you're, you're going to do that parenting program, aren't you? And, and I would have people tell me, I'm not that kind of parent. I don't need that kind of help. And I'm still hearing that now. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you have any, you know, good lines to respond to um, why someone would benefit, someone that in particular that you yes. don't even know yep. when they say something like that. You can't say, well, I saw you yesterday and I think you yes. want to. It's more of the, um, you know, this is what you get out of it. So I'm wondering if you have... Look, yeah, it's, there's not a single line there that I could just roll out, of the, uh, um, although I'll think about it. Uh, um, it's, it's more that I'd be focusing with parents on the idea of how their children are likely to benefit from uh, living in a world of positive parenting. And I mean, when we can kind of talk about the impact of um, positive parenting on children's language, their capacity to regulate their emotions and feelings, to be better behaved, to have, be more cooperative, do better at school, to have better peer relationships. Most of these things are things that parents want. What they're not interested in is hearing about, will you do this program to prevent drug abuse? Or you do this program to prevent your kids getting into serious crime later on or to prevent teen pregnancy? It's too remote. It's too far removed from um, the immediacy of the context. 
But sometimes if you're talking about reducing the, the stress of daily living, of you know, managing work and family responsibilities and when there are smoother transitions from home to work and work to home, you know, you've got a happier household, a quieter household, a less stressful household, kids get on well. So that kind of messaging about it being positive, solution focused, optimistic, and it's not about uh, turning off all of the ills of the world, which the parent may think is not them. It's too easy to dismiss if you approach it like that. But if you approach it, do you want your kids to do well, to have friends, to get on well at school? Everyone wants that, don't they? I would think so. Okay, well, we're yeah. pretty much at the end of the show. So thank you very much, everyone.